Okay, one way over. So uh, I just want to briefly go back to this slide here. So we have four different driving conditions. Remember this. So we have four different conditions. So if definition is you use an over when you have three or more, you have a scale dependent variable on the y axis, and you have an uh, nomina categorically. Um, uh, uh independent variable with different levels the number of levels defines the groupings and these groupings determine whether you use a t-test with two you can use a t-test if the two levels are before and after then you use a pair of somebody that if you have three or more yeah. if you have three or more you use an ANOVA if the subjects are different in these groups then you use between groups if they're the same, and it goes through all these different stages. So the first drive alone, then the drive with a fashion, then the drive with a video phone, and then with a cell phone, then you have a within groups and over. Fairly logic, right? If it's only one independent variable, you use a one way and over. If you have two or more, then it's a two way or three way or more, more, more way and over. Simple. Good. Uh, so once you get through all, so keep this in mind. This is this is basically the useful slide uh, slide for that. Uh, and, um, it comes back repeatedly, and I like this summary tables because that really gives you a quick overview and a quick idea of, of which test to use. And that's basically where the money is for the final, um, where you need to understand which method am I going to use for this respective question. What do I have in the question provided? What do I have at my disposition and what method am I going to use? So you calculate the variance between groups as a, uh, over the variance within groups. That gives you an F score. <coughs> Why is it important to keep in mind as, as, as a memory helper? Whether you want to remember it's variance between groups or variance within groups, the variance within groups is always going to be larger because it's a sum of squares that you essentially are going for. And that sum of squares is always going to be larger within the groups because you have more deviation, you have more error. If you have only the group, you kind of you smoothen out that error, you take that error out by basically building an average and just subtracting averages. So the larger the variance between the groups, the larger the differences between the groups in the numerator that will inflate your F score. And if your variance within the groups is smaller, and that estimate from that group is really good. And it really reflects what it means to reflect in the group and what, what your research question is asking for. If that is smaller, your F score goes up. So either it's a larger numerator or a smaller denominator that gets your F up. Okay, between groups, within groups, one way between groups, we talked about this. Random, uh, know the assumptions. Random selection of samples, uh, normally distributed sample and homoscedasticity. Homoscedasticity being comparable variance between those groups. Keep in mind homo and heteroscedasticity. Go uh, also remember it from the t test where we have an independent sample t test for equal variance. Uh, homoscedasticity is basically being used differently than heteroscedasticity with an unequal variance t test. And you remember from the t-test, we basically did this comparison. We pooled our variance. We got a pooled variance. And from that, we got to our pooled standard error of the mean. Good. And that was the example. Also, memorize how to calculate the degree, degrees of freedom for the respective uh, groups. So you have degrees of freedom between, which is the number of groups, minus n. Which is which also will come back when we talk about regression analysis. Then you have the degrees of freedom within. That's the degrees of freedom of each respective group added up, which can also hypothetically be transformed with the sum of all participants minus the number of the groups. It comes to the same thing. You're just subtracting one for each group. Good. Uh, F distribution, unimodal, right skewed uh, with a critical cutoff. Then calculation of the F. I've seen that before. This is all, this is this is fabulous slide. This is good to kind of visualize it and keep it in mind. Um, flagging this slide too. Uh, it's kind of nice to see what it's actually all about because you see 
the within group variance is basically depicted here with the variability within the group and the variance between the means is basically shown uh, as the distance from the respective group to the grand mean. Same concept applies. You basically do nothing else uh, to calculate again the deviation, the squaring the deviation, you sum it up to the sum of squares and you have your sum of squares. Once you have the sum of squares, you can easily calculate knowing the number of the groups or the degrees of freedom, you can easily calculate the variance. And the same concept applies with the within group variance. It's basically just calculating the sum of squares for each of these groups uh, and adding them up. That's pretty much what you do. Okay, source table. Know how to read and interpret a source table. That's really important. So know all these components. And we've gone through it uh, in much detail. Uh, we will see also on Wednesday, we're gonna play around in R again a bit. We're gonna see the, the printout. We're gonna see the printout essentially uh, shown as it is produced by R. It pretty much looks the same from all statistical software, whether it's R, SPSS, SAS, or SysDot, or what, whatever software you use, it kind of follows the same outline. So that's the nomenclature. That's kind of the standard for me. Uh, there's some additional information, but that we get to that once we look at the R code with the R output. So we know that, we know we've done that between groups. We've seen this formula know where to locate the formula, know how to find it, know how it translates into the respective uh, components in the source table. You will have a couple of exercises in the, in the homework. And I, I, I know that the homework is not super difficult and likely uh, you have, yeah, uh, don't rely. <laughs> Don't rely on that the homework is the same as in the previous semesters, just as a heads up. So I want you to do these exercises <laughs> for the sake of trying them. So always make sure that you know what you're looking at. Okay, uh, so these calculations are basically uh, simple, but it is important that you know and understand how to do them. So between groups, we did that. Uh, so bring all together. So you're rejecting once it exceeds the critical value. The critical value is read from the F score table, which we have looked at. Uh, where we the F score table. is basically read, uh, keep in mind that you have a numerator and denominator. Numerator is the, the number of groups minus one and the denominator is your within groups uh, degrees of freedom. So that's the total number of participants minus the number of the groups. That's your degrees of freedom for each group. Uh, you find your respective column, which corresponds with your degrees of freedom in the numerator. You find the respective row um, by finding the degrees of freedom within. That basically gets your critical threshold once you follow the line for your alpha. Good. Um, so that's how you do uh, locate your critical volume. Calculate. Uh, also keep in mind the effect size is calculated as the so-called R square. And there's a little caveat, and it is not in the slides for some reason, which I will never really comprehend. Uh, Norton and Heinzen are not presenting both effect sizes, although they have it in the quizzes and in the books. So there are two different analyses of variant effect sizes. There's the R squared, which is also used in the non in the non uh, so it's, so it's, it's the same value. Uh, so it's sum of squares between divided by sum of squares both. And so it basically, conceptually, we're calculating the ratio between the between groups variability over the within groups variability. Now we're quantifying the effect size by taking into account how much of the total variability that we're seeing, what proportion of the total variability basically is weighted on the variability within uh, between the groups, not between the groups. 
So you basically you find out what proportion is explained for or accounted for by the differences between the groups. And that's important because that is the drive. You remember when I said like the variability in the numerator is large. So the variability between the groups is large that gets the F score. If the variability within the groups is small, that gets the F score up as well. But now you really, you want to emphasize the proportion of which, which is accounted for by the variability between the groups. So that's how this became the effect size. Uh, we will encounter the R square again, this time without the synonym when we get to the regression, topic of regression, because regression means to predict. So it kind of, it gives you, um, what should I say? It gives you an, an, an idea, bless you. It gives you an idea about the accuracy of your prediction. Um, but we get to that when uh, with chapter 16. Okay, so we're getting the proportion or weight uh, in the total variability that is accounted for by the differences between the groups. Alternatively, we also have an omega squared. The omega squared is basically slightly deviating from uh, our F squared or R squared. And it basically also in uh, takes into account uh, the degrees of freedom. But basically, rather using the variance and the degrees of freedom between here rather than the sum of squares total. So it kind of, it quote unquote, adjusts it for the degrees of freedom. However, the nomenclature and convention is the same for both. Uh, you have here the conventions on the right. Uh, 0 0.01 is a small effect size. Uh, 0 0.01 to 0 0.06 is medium and 0 0.14 is large. Everything greater than 0 0.14 is large. Um, okay. That's the R squared. Effect size conventions. And now we're getting to what we didn't get to before in, in enough detail. That's why I'm repeating it. So we have a post hoc test. Post hoc means it's a test that you're doing after the event has occurred, the event being here the analysis. So you have two different post hoc tests. One is the Taki HSD, the Taki Honest Significant Difference Test. The second one is the so called Bonferroni Adjusted Alpha. So you basically a Bonferroni postdoc test is, to be honest, it's a more common one, but they're both kind of going in the same direction. So the only two reasons why you do postdoc testing is when your ANOVA was significant or alternatively when you had a priori plant comparisons. And the way you're doing them is basically, you're not gonna go into the calculations, you have the spreadsheet and you're gonna see the video. For those of you who are interested in calculations, uh, I did it with the other class. Somehow my time management is better with the cheese lab. <laughs> and I feel a little guilty towards you guys, but uh, I keep to be uh, going on rambling more with you. So we have uh, the HSD is calculated uh, as M minus M1 minus M2. So this is not M minus M2. This is the mean of one group minus the mean of another group divided <laughs> by. Uh, it's kind of a standard error of the mean, so it's basically a variance divided by uh, a sample size square rooted and gets you then the HSD, which also can be uh, translated into so called Q. And this Q is basically then read as a, uh, from a Q table, and once it exceeds this comparison between the respective group, exceeds that critical Q from the Q table, you basically you would reject it. Otherwise you wouldn't. It goes in the same direction in a way, in a, in, a, in a very abstract way, it goes in the same direction. It's not consistent, but it goes in the same direction to a Bonferroni test. The Bonferroni test takes the major principle into account that the reason why we're doing an overtesting is that you doing, if you do multiple comparisons, you're inflating your type one error. Therefore, the logical approach to that is if you do then the multiple comparisons, you could approach this by lowering your alpha. And if you get your alpha down and you only account for smaller uh, p-values as your thresholds, then you basically you get uh, 
you get smaller critical regions and you basically, you're kind of mitigating your risk to run into that one area. So that's Bonferroni. Also here, you basically, you see the Bonferroni alpha level. So you basically, you come from 5% with two comparisons, uh, with one comparison with two groups, uh, down to like 0 0.2 or 0 0.2 with seven means or 21 comparisons. Good. So that was between groups. I just quickly wanted to uh, go through the postdoc. Yes. Bonferroni. Yes. Uh, I utilize the table. So, so the formula is essentially, it's the p-value that perfect p divided by the number of comparisons. Any other questions? I think in over once you really, once you kind of penetrated it intellectually, it's, it's actually quite a simple test. It's just the concept really will guide you through, uh, to how you will approach it. Okay. So now let's get started with the within groups in a while. So, the principle is somewhat the same as the peer sample key test. So uh, the same participants went through all the levels of the of the um, of the independent variable. So keep in mind the driving conditions. You have four different driving conditions. Each of these drivers went so merged on the particular highway under the same four conditions. And uh, it's also known as repeated meshes ANOVA. So the way you can also think of that, if you have, for example, let's assume you have the following example. Let's, let's assume you have two groups that you want to compare. And you have these two groups. They're basically, um, that wasn't good. Um, let's say you have one group of individuals that you study over four periods of time and you basically, you have them under four different conditions. Let's say you have blood pressure and you start them on a blood pressure medication and you wanna know whether this actually dropped between three different doses. So you basically have repeated measures of blood pressure over time and you basically, you start the medication at, at low dose and then you wait a month and then you increase the dose and get the patient higher and higher dose. That would be one example where you could use repeated measures and over hypothetically, because you have three different levels. You have no medication, you have low dose and you have high dose. And these three different levels, that would be your, uh, your repeated measures and over. So again, so we have uh, independent variables at least three levels a scale dependent variable, and it's the same participants in all levels of the independent variable. And now we're getting to what I alluded to before. So it reduces error due to differences between the groups. So it takes this error out. It, it takes out that error that is coming from something else than the differences between the groups. So it kind of minimizes that error that you have caused by differences between the individuals in the respective groups. Because if you have people with, I don't know, with very high blood pressure, and uh, then you have another group with very low blood pressure, there is a lot of variance just because uh, the people in your group are just so inherently different. Then you have another group with less variable blood pressure. So think of these variabilities. And if that individual goes through all three groups uh, in the same fashion, you basically, you take this subject specific variability out of that equation. And you're basically, you're removing that from your total variability and you're removing that from your within group variability. And thereby you get that ratio to more accurately reflect the differences between the groups. Yes. One individual, that's why the error is in there, right? Because it's one individual under these circumstances. But I don't understand how it removes the error because 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Yes, the error is still there, but um, mm -hmm. uh, okay. So let's move away from the blood pressure example. Let's go to something that is maybe a little bit easier to see. When done. Let's assume a between groups ANOVA in which you have a group that is super happy, happiness score, back to the happiness score. You have a group that is super happy. Then you have a group that's actually in a pretty good mood. And then you have another group that like, so you have these three different groups and they're substantially different. And if you want to understand, uh, so now you take that one group, you do nothing with. The other group you're gonna send on, uh, I don't know, daily running and daily, I don't know, daily exercise. And then you have the third group, you send them to do daily yoga and you put them on an antidepressant. So the differences between these three groups are basically likely strong, but because they were at the, at the beginning, they were so largely different the differences that you observe then between the groups is not accurately reflecting the difference between the groups, but is strongly influenced by the, by the baseline happiness of the people in the group. So this is this within group variance and this within group levels that are affecting your between groups variability. So you're assuming that the groups that are not happy will get happier. It's, it's irrelevant. It, it's the group that is already very happy and doesn't have any intervention. They were happy in the beginning and likely they're still happy at the end of my study. But if I have an intervention and now suddenly you get the unhappy ones happier, that difference that you see may be caused just because of the fact that suddenly you have like a group of unhappy people and they're, they're, there's somebody, they're doing something different and that change may be larger than it would have been if that group would have been happy at baseline. So the, these are the, the characteristics are different between the groups. So now, if I'm interested only in the differences between the groups, in the differences in the efficacy of my intervention, I wanna take that factor out altogether because it's a confounder. It's a confounder and selection bias in my assessment and to understand what is the difference between the groups at the end of my study? And you're taking this out by using the same individual that comes in like, either he's happy or he's not happy, it doesn't matter. Because he will be compared, he or she will be compared to what he was at the beginning of my study. Oh, so based on the individuals arriving in the group, they're compared to like... Exactly. So you take the variability between subjects out of that equation. You take that out and you, you, you tease out the true group difference. That is the idea of composing groups and over. And this is where this is actually a quite advanced and quite accurate estimate of your group difference. This is quite an often, often, yeah, it's quite an often used. You find that in the scientific literature. So the problem is it's, so it was probably, I would say in psychometrics and in, in, in psychology is more common. Uh, in medicine right now, what's really taking over are more sophisticated models, which are basically using the system like an ANOVA as an underlying analytic basis and then pack it in a super sophisticated fancy model. That, that's what's happening. Uh, so there are models that are basically, uh, yeah, I don't want to get into too much detail, but there you can, you can take additional factors into account and can deal with them even better. But that's that's far beyond the scope of this class. But this is the basis of a lot of advanced analytics. ANOVA will, will build the segue into all regression analysis. So this this really matters. But yeah, it's 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 a common test. You will find this quite frequent, and I, I guarantee. Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> 
So the groups are identical for all of the other relevant variables because of each groups includes exactly the same participants. And that's, that's what I said, right? You have the same individual, the variability of unknown factors like happiness, a baseline, or I don't know, lifestyle factors, or is that individual depressed, or is the individual antidepressant, or whatever affects happiness will be the same between all three groups, same individuals. Reduces within group variability due to difference with this, um, across groups. Um, calculations are similar. You again calculate in, in the sum of squares between groups, within groups, total sum of squares. But now in addition to that, you calculate a subject sum of squares. And this is basically that sum of squares that is then removed or re uh, subtracted from the within group sum of squares. So you literally, you're, you're subtracting one from the other. The unit is the same, so you just subtract them. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> unit, that's an interesting question. <laughs> okay, you have, uh, what's a unit everybody knows? You have, um, you have a classroom uh, full with students uh, and you weigh their, uh, their weight. And you have an uh, average weight of let's say 60 kilograms and you calculate uh, 60 kilograms or 60 pounds. Oh no, 100, 100, 130 pounds. If you calculate the standard deviation, does the standard deviation have a unit or not? Bless you. Yeah. Why not? Ah, that's a good question. I like it. Does it have a unit? The mean keeps the unit, right? It's it's a mean of 70 pounds or 120 pounds or whatever. But what is the unit of the standard division? Does the standard division have a unit? No, uh, the standard division. Okay, the central tendency, central tendency, the mean has the unit, right? So does the median and so does the mode. Does the standard deviation have a unit? No. Why not? It's not a, it's not a unit, it's not a measurement that has a unit adapted. Why is it not? Okay. I think it is. Well, I, I don't know. I, I want to hear more opinions. <laughs> Convince me it doesn't have a unit. A label is something that you're trying to extract from. Why not? If, uh, if, but it also doesn't measure, so one of these is not like measured by. What does it measure? Yeah, but if 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 I lose five pounds from uh, I don't know from December to March, the difference is five pounds. Why not? Well, I guess you can. I think you. Yeah, I'm giving this away in a way, um, but I, I understand. But um, think about it. How you calculate? Think about how you calculate the standard division. And I, I know it's, but it's it's a super important point because uh, believe it or not, I would I would bet there are a lot of people that don't know that. And not just those that are just learning it. Trust me. <laughs> if you have variance, okay, so we're calculating here the variance, the sum of squares, right? So if you calculate a difference in the, that's the fairness score. Let's say this is weight. You calculate the difference from here to here. Does that have a unit? From here to here has a unit, right? From here to here has a unit. If I'm squaring this and I have here uh, five kilos, three kilos, two kilos, and I'm squaring it, does that have a unit? Yeah. What is the unit? Kilogram square, right? Yeah. If I'm squaring it. So the unit of the sum of these two is kilogram squared. So that's the sum of squares. If I add them up, 
since they have the same unit, I can add them up. And then I have like a sum of squares, which is as the unit of kilograms squared. If I'm dividing this now by my degrees of freedom, and let's say this is three, and I'm dividing this by two, does that have a unit? Still has a unit. So that's my variance. So the variance is kilogram squared. If I'm employing, if I'm square rooting this now, does that have a unit? Yes. Yes. What well, is the unit? Square root. Hmm? Square root. No, kilogram square. If I square root kilogram squared, what's my unit? Kilogram. No. Square. Just oh, kilogram. Yeah. Oh. Okay, fine. <laughs> so a standard division has a unit. And the unit is the same unit as the average. Because the standard deviation is nothing else than the deviation from the mean. Okay. Okay. That's a fun example. Okay, good. All right, good. Um, dim, 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 dim. Um, where did we start now? Why did I talk about this? Yeah. Yeah, if uh, this is this is literally the first thing you think about uh, whenever you look at something that you have calculated, uh, you want to understand what is the unit of my product or my result. So if you go into mathematics and it goes to mathematical modeling, and like first you're gonna look at the units because these units need to match up. So and you're gonna make sure if you use an equation from a scientific paper and you punch this into Excel, it's like always check first the units. Even mathematicians make mistakes. Particularly, no, it's like, it's, I, I did that quite a bit for uh, really old papers. When I looked into dialyzer characteristics and I looked into diffusive forces across the membrane. So I went back to really old papers from the 60s and 70s. I, I'm not naming, I'm not saying any names. <laughs> Great papers, right? But you, you've had like unit errors and you're like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna solve this. So they left like one thing out or not. It's like, it, it happens, right? Well, no, but it's it, 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 to to the defense of the mathematicians. They were not, well, they were mathematical papers, but they were not mathematicians. Okay, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, but yeah, always double check the units. That's that's the units always need to add up, and they they, they need to make sense. So make sure to always pay attention to the units. So we were at within groups. Uh, okay. Okay, the subject sum of squares reduces the within groups, sum of squares per removal variability. We had that. So steps of hypothesis testing. Uh, yeah, we have discussed those at the open. So we identify the population, we identify the distribution, and we're identifying the assumptions, which we know is. For the regular ANOVA, it's random sampling, normal distribution, uh, and homoscedasticity. For the within groups ANOVA, we have a fourth one. Why do we have a fourth one? We remember order effects, right? From the paired sample t-test. And this is, as you can imagine, with an ANOVA, this is even more of a problem because you have now more than, we have three or more uh, levels of the independent variable. So that border effect is even more of a problem here. I had the example of uh, blood pressure, like no medication, small starting dose, and then full blown dose. Obviously, if you have an order effect, you have an order effect in there. So it's actually, you need to be careful whether you actually can analyze this data in that format. Um, so order effect needs to be taken into account. And in case you assume an order effect, you need to also uh, account for it and mitigate it by using counterbalancing. Yes. What do you mean by order effect? Because if you're measuring someone's blood pressure without medication. Yeah, okay. Uh, blood pressure is not a good example because you also you not, not only have an order effect, you also have a carryover effect. Um, Let's think of the driving condition. Uh, you have four different conditions, and cell phone condition is higher than uh, 
in video phone. I never really understood that. But what if it was the same individual driving those four different conditions through? And then, uh, I don't know, they participated in, that, in uh, they participated in that experiment that they drove up that highway, they drove all the way around. They did it the first time, very low risk. Then they did it the second time, there was a passenger next to them and the guy keeps on talking, 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 and like it's really annoying, it's exhausting. Then third time they drive with a video phone already, you see a higher risk, right? And then fourth time, cell phone, they're totally annoyed with the study, they're tired, they're cranky, and they're more likely to have an accident. Does that make sense? As an example. So it's you have an order effect. You have something that uh, comes from the previous condition that carries over in in in, in the following condition. I know my example is a little unconventional, but it kind of illustrates it, I think. Okay, uh, so that's the order effect. Keep that in mind. Uh, counterbalancing would be one way to go. Counterbalancing it would be done that you kind of randomize between those four different conditions and you kind of assign different uh, conditions uh, or different conditions to start with for different individuals. So you randomize the order in which individuals are starting with the respective condition. Okay. uh yeah okay uh, here we come uh okay so same assumptions um could ideally avoid order effects um that is the additional assumption use the f distribution or the comparison distribution it's pretty much the same the only difference is you quantify the subject uh, sum of squares and subtract this from your variant um, null and research hypothesis is again the same. So we do mu one, mu two. What's a little different now? Let's maybe do this in Excel already. What's different now is the degrees of freedom between is again the number of groups. So that's the number of levels of the independent variable minus one. We have the degrees of freedom of subjects. That's uh, the number of your subjects minus one. Note the subtle difference between N, lowercase, and N, uppercase. Lowercase indicates it's the number of subjects, whereas uh, uppercase n indicates it's the total number of degrees of freedom in your entire set, because each subject undergoes each level of the independent variable. That means that you need to account in your total degrees of freedom each time a subject does something. So if that individual goes through four different driving conditions and it's five subjects, the degrees of freedom total is n total minus one. So that's 20 minus one, rather than five minus one for the degrees of freedom subject. Good. Um, what's that? Okay. And that's the calculations. We're doing this now. Okay. Uh, let's open the Excel, um, the Excel spreadsheet. So we did we did wine drinkers with, uh, with the tea test. Now we're at beer. So we're doing now a comparison between five different, uh, three different, uh, uh, three different qualities of beer. We do cheap beer, mid-range beer, and high-end beer. We are basically uh, starting off by taking so five participants. Five participants, they all drink the same beers. And they end up with they end up with an estimate of um, their liking of that um, beer. The only thing you need to do, you need to bring this in a again long format. So you just need to copy this down. And that's pretty simple. So we have here five times cheap beer. We have five times uh, mid-range beer. And we have five times some high-end beer. Okay, so uh, this is beer type. 
And now we're next. We're, let's do a step one first. Step one, so that's five individuals. Five individuals, three different peers. To step two. Uh, step two, we're formulating our null hypothesis. And that is basically that all three are the same. Mean one equals mean two equals mean three. And we such hypothesis at least one differs from another. Step three is now the degrees of freedom. So we're characterizing our groups. Um, so we have now degrees of freedom. This over. Degrees of freedom between subjects within and total. So degrees of freedom. Oops. So degrees of freedom between is uh, three minus one, right? It's two. Degrees of freedom subject is five minus one, it's four. What is a three because of the three different subjects? No, subjects. Uh, degrees of freedom subjects is uh, n minus one. So then we have decrease of freedom within. So that's decrease of freedom between multiplied by the number of subjects, decrease of freedom uh, within. So this is now um, two multiplied by four. So that's eight. Right? Then we have the decrease of freedom totally. That is the total. So that's two plus four plus eight. And uh, alternatively, it would be uh, all entries, which would be five multiplied by three. So that's basically uh, 15 minus one. Alternatively, it's eight plus four plus two, 14. Okay. So now we are going to the next step. We're calculating now first, we, do, uh, we need to calculate the grand mean, which is simple, right? It's like grand mean is just the average, of uh, all the B ratings. Then we need next, we need to calculate. So, and this is where it's getting a little bit trickier, right? Because now we need a group mean and we need a subject mean. So the group mean is now, the group is literally the B is, so this is average of these five estimates, oops. The average of these five uh, ratings. And we're basically, we are rating these. Now the next one is basically uh, 16, so that's J16 to J20. It's 34.6. And the last group is basically J21. To 
was 52.6. So when you compare these group means, you see already that that's quite a substantial difference. So these two years came with the really dropped the left here, so that must be the angle P. So we're basically, we're seeing now that this basically makes a difference. So the question is now, if we had a lot of within groups variability, this would be essentially a confounding and kind of disguising and concealing that difference uh, between these uh, groups. So for that very reason, we're calculating now, uh, in addition, what we want to tease out and remove is the different is, is uh, the subject sum of squares. So the variability that basically is explained away by the differences between the subjects. So we have, um, we're, bless you, we have now a, a subject average to calculate. And this is basically um, the average of each time the subject drinks that beer. So this is J11. to uh, comma. So this is a little trick here. <laughs> so we need to J11 to J, uh, oops, let me do that. Uh, comma, dollar J16, dollar 16, dollar J, dollar J, dollar. 16, okay, so now we have it, comma, J, dollar 21. Okay, so that is subject number one. So if we're bringing this all the way down here, we can now easily manipulate this formula by uh, making this a 12, this is 17, this is 22. So that's now subject number two. Now we do uh, 13, 17, no, 18, and no, it's not here. two, two, okay. Now this is 13, while this is 18, while this is 23. Now this is 14. This is, the next is 19. This is 24. And um, this is 15, 20. And this is 25. Okay, and now we just need to copy that whole block down. I know this is a little involved now, <laughs> well uh, but this, the trick is really that you would uh, lock it in for each of these rows and then just copy the entire block because otherwise it would shift. So that, that is kind of the fastest way to do that. So I will share the spreadsheet, sorry for that. Yeah, it's, it's a little tricky. Um, but basically these are all the means that we need for the calculation of all the sum of squares. So uh, we have the grand mean, we have the mean minus the grand mean, we have a participant mean minus the grand mean that can all be calculated now easily with uh, what we have at our disposition. So if we do uh, x minus gm squared, then we calculate x minus gm, which is our grand mean. Square. 
And that's that's how different yeah, that's that's pretty much all we need to do. We just need to log in the grand mean now. And then go all the way down. So that's all that's needed. So now we propagate the formula down. We're locking in the grand mean and we basically we get an estimate for each of these. I think for the next semester I probably gotta provide this part. The subject mean is a little tricky to calculate. And we have uh, m minus g m squared. We have now the m minus the g m m minus g m. That's our M, so this is our sum of squares between. And lastly, we just need uh, M participant minus GM. Minus GM squared is M participant minus GM. Okay, so that's basically how you calculate all this sum of squares. So you logically only need the sum of M11 to M24, uh, 25. So that gets you the sum of squares for X minus GM, which is our total. Then we can calculate the, uh, the sum of squares here for between by M minus GM squared. And then we get, uh, M participant minus GM squared. Um, that gets us our sum of the subjects. So then if we label it, it becomes SS total. And it's SS between SS subject. Then it's a sum of squares within is now actually facilitated by calculating the sum of square total minus the sum of square between minus the sum of square subtract. And this is where you subtract them, the sum of square subtract. So you know that the total incorporates sum of squares between and the sum of squares within. And now you keep uh, again subtracting sum of square subtract. So that gets you that last sum of squares. And now, from now on, it's basically simple. So the only thing you need to do now is so you have degrees of freedom two, four, eight, and 14 for the different degrees of freedom. So the only thing you need to do, you go on the F squared table. You, have, you find now the degrees of freedom in the numerator. So we have three groups and it's two degrees of freedom between. So that's column two. We're going now for uh, degrees of freedom in the denominator within groups is uh, subjects multiplied by groups. That's 15 minus the number of groups. So this is 12. So we have two and 12 for uh, alpha of 0 0.05. We're looking at 3.89 as our critical value. So critical value Typical value is 3.89. If we're calculating now our F, uh, let's do this in the source table. Okay, so source table, we do sum of squares, we do degrees of freedom, we do uh, our variance, and then we do the F. We're gonna start with uh, between groups, within groups, subjects and total. So sum of square we know now is between groups is 1092, within groups is 295, 
subtract is 729. So there's a very strong variability between the subtracts, right? Because if you were just to calculate between and within, well, this would be an enormous difference. So that would be a very large difference. So now you basically, you take this effect out and the sum is basically the sum of these three. That's 2117 degrees of freedom between is two. Within is, um, what is it, 12? Subject is uh, four. Two four eight within is two multiplied by four. It's four individuals. It's two degrees of freedom of eight. My bad. So it's groups minus one, and the total is basically the sum of these. And we have the variance. That's uh, sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. So now we get uh, these three variances. So the actual F is now between divided by within. And for the subject F, we're basically, we're getting a subject divided by within, gets us a subject F, which we don't need essentially. But what you see is that it took up the variability of um, from the subject, basically gets us to an F that is somewhat smaller, but still, enormously high and still rejecting the null hypothesis. So we're rejecting the null hypothesis at a p-value of less than 5%. Any questions? It's simple, right? It's, it's not, it's not So we have sum of squares total, sum of squares between, sum of squares subject, sum of squares within. So basically you're lining it up in the same format uh, you're calculating the respective variance and then the respective F squares. The R squares basically calculated in sum of squares between divided by sum of square total and the sum of square subjects. Sum of squares uh, between divided by sum of squares total minus sum of square subject. That's just an R square of 0 0.70, which emphasizes what I said before, is like that tremendous difference between the groups. So the, uh, since you have the group mean, okay, the group mean, uh, you have these two rather uh, variable fields, and then you have the high end mean, and there's a tremendous difference. That's the that's difference of, well, that's like 60, 70 percent difference uh, uh, from mid range to mid range and cheap to the high end beer. So that emphasizes this difference between uh, the groups. And then in addition, we're also still taking out subject, the effect of subject variance. So that gets us to a very large effect size. Then we can also calculate the tacky which is the formula here. For that, we don't have time. Uh, lastly, we are just talking about so-called, uh, yeah, so I personally have never heard of that. I wouldn't have labeled it that way. Let's, let's put it that way. I, I know the concept, the concept is clear. Uh, so it's so-called weird samples, which basically weird indicates they're Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic which is a substantially different group than you would have from different parts of the country because they are less privileged. Uh, so therefore you need to be very cautious in your interpretation and generalization of findings. 
Um, for that very reason, a lot of reports and a lot of reporting guidelines are calling for constraints on generality statements, which is basically a, st a statement uh, about the target population in which the study results should generalize. And if you remember the happiness reports that we talked about and the visual displays of uh, graphics, so we saw that bubble graph of happiness and uh, like the cross cross profit uh, in the country. Um, so you basically you had like countries that were just really not happy, but they also were very poor. So you cannot compare the happiness and whatever you find within the country to that dynamic that you would see in different countries. Uh, so that's just important to keep in mind when it comes to reporting of your data and also in your inference of data. Good. Any questions to any of what we discussed? If not, that's all I have for today. I wish you a nice evening. See you on Wednesday, and we're going to get uh, deeper into ANOVA. You also learn how to program it. Any questions on Zoom? No. All right. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.